Let's pray. Our good and gracious God, we pray that you would remind us again through your word and impress upon us that you are good and that you are gracious and you are great and glorious. We pray that you would teach us in these next moments together to learn what we did not know, to remember what we may have forgotten, that you would convict those who are mired in sin and you would comfort those who are mired in weakness. Give us ears to hear, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our text this evening is from Daniel chapter 7, page 744, if you're using the Pew Bibles. Daniel chapter 7. You'll notice quickly as we turn from Daniel 6 to Daniel 7 that we are in a different kind of literature. Same book, same author, still in Aramaic before it switches back to Hebrew. So these two sections, 1 through 6, 7 through 12, have overlap, are meant to be together, but a different kind of writing. On a normal day, many of you read from five or six or 10 or 15 different kinds of writing, and you do it seamlessly. You check a Facebook status update, you read an Instagram caption, you pick up the newspaper, those still exist in various places, and perhaps in the newspaper you may read the comics or the sports or something about politics or a letter to the editor. And later in the day, you have to look at one of your manuals for the washing machine. And then at night, you're reading a J.I. Packer book to get ready for your small group. And sometime in the next day, because you have 10 mythical minutes all to yourself, you are thumbing through Lord of the Rings. Very different kinds of literature. Now, you don't think as you move seamlessly through those different writings, ah, I am moving from one genre to the next. You may not even know that term or care to know it. There's no official committee out there that decides and declares this is science fiction genre, this is washing machine genre, and this is going to be only pictures as you put together your IKEA furniture with an Allen wrench but you understand instinctively to read those differently. No one needs to tell you to read the comics differently than you read J.I. Packer, which is different than you read an appliance manual, which is different from a fantasy novel. You understand instinctively. There are certain rules, certain features and figures in these different kinds of writing. And so it is as we turn from Daniel 6 to Daniel 7. We have changed genres from historical narrative to what's often called apocalyptic literature. Now, nothing says, hear ye, hear ye, we are now entering a new genre of Daniel, and yet we can see the difference immediately, and we will read the text in just a moment. But already in verse 1, we are in the realm of dreams and visions. It's not unlike some of the dreams and visions that the kings have had prior that Daniel had to interpret. But now we are into apocalyptic literature, and that very language maybe sounds intimidating, or maybe it's very exciting. Oh, this is really good. Apocalyptic just sounds, where are the helicopters and the explosions and dragons? And Well, that's not actually what it means. Apocalypsis is simply a Greek word to reveal, to unveil, uncover. So, this type of literature is often called apocalyptic because, yes, it may deal with things at the future or even the end of history, but because it is revealing through pictures, through images, through impressions, various truths. We see this kind of literature here in Daniel, Ezekiel, parts of the other prophets, certain parts of the Gospels, and then Revelation, which is Apocalypse, that's its Greek name. How should we read this sort of literature when you come to it in your Bible? Just a few points before we actually get to the text. Number one, keep in mind that we are dealing with visual impressions. So, verse 2 says, I saw, 
verse 7, after this, I saw, again, verse 12, their lives were prolonged for a season and a times, and then in verse 13, I saw, or several times we have the language of I looked. So verse 4, then I looked. As I looked, its wings were plucked off. Or again in verse 6, after this I looked, same in verse 9 and 11, or verse 13 again, and behold. So we have this language which is very visual in nature. He's seeing something. There is an impression upon him. So often we can get ourselves into trouble with apocalyptic literature if we focus on the trees instead of the forest. Now, we'll see that the individual trees do matter, but if we try to over-interpret every single element looking at the trees, we miss the bigger picture, which is the forest. What is the, the visual impression that this gives you? Here's a second principle for understanding apocalyptic literature, similar to the first. Apocalyptic literature deals with general symbols. Now, general symbols as opposed to a secret code. Uh, I remember preaching through Revelation years and years ago, and inevitably at different times in that series, people would come up to me and they would have their theory for what the, the locusts meant or their theory for the bulls, and they were elaborate theories that dealt with Revelation as some kind of secret code. This thing means this thing, and it's usually some thing torn from the headlines of current events. That's not how apocalyptic literature works. Yes, there's something mysterious to it, but it's meant to reveal truth, not to give us a code that we figure Christians will only break sometime 2,000 years later. It is not a random allegorical puzzle to be deciphered. So again, what's more important is the, the general sense of the symbolism. If I were to say to you that I had a dream, a vision, and I have not had this particular vision, but if I said I had a dream and an insect-looking creature crawled out of the wall in our home, and it had three heads and ten eyes and buzzing wings, and it grew to an enormous size and it carried away my entire family, this may be my wife's nightmare. I looked, and it was, behold, two in the morning, and there was not a light outside, only the sound of buzzing wings all around me. If I were to have a dream like that, I said, what do you think it means? Would you go and say, hmm, now what do the ten eyes, maybe, uh, well, you only have eight kids, so it can't be the ten kids, hmm, uh, in the wings, in the 2 a.m., the two means some, no, you would step back and you would understand the general symbolism means it's a scary vision about something bad happening to my family, so thankfully I haven't had that vision. So we're dealing with visual impressions, general symbolism, third principle. Almost always in apocalyptic literature, there is a reference for something both present and something future. So something present, this had to mean something to the people who were originally reading it or hearing it. So there's something present, it's not just here, here's good news for you about something that's in a galaxy far, far away. No, it has something present, but it also spins out, and there is a further fulfillment, which leads to a fourth principle. The meaning in apocalyptic literature is often not exhausted by one person, one place, one time, or one thing. This is true with all prophetic literature, especially when we deal with apocalyptic imagery, that the referent is not exhausted. This equals that. That king in Greece in 164 BC, right there, that's it. Usually there is a near historical referent and then often something that spins out to a different time, place, person, or thing. So with all of that in mind, let's work our way through Daniel chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came out of the sea different from one another. 
The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man and the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked and behold, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back and the beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth it devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool, his throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand, thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed." and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth, But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And about the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn that came up and before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things and that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, as for the fourth beast... There shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and he shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law. And they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end, and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. So after interpreting a number of visions for various kings of the kingdoms, now Daniel has a vision of his own. They are recounted in chronological order in the rest of the book. You'll notice chapter 8, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, and so on throughout the book. But chapter 7, we are back at the first year of Belshazzar, 
king of Babylon, around 550 B.C. I want you to notice what Daniel saw, three visions, what he heard, two explanations, and then we'll finish briefly with one overarching point. Three visions, two explanations, one overarching point. So look at the first vision. It's in verses 1 through 8. When we begin to look at the individual trees, the forest doesn't seem so unusual. There is a way to make sense of this madness. You have four winds indicating the universality in scope, stirring up the great sea, the Mediterranean. And right there, we know that these kings coming from the sea, we think of, oh, you're going to have a holiday at the sea, but the sea was a place of chaos in the ancient world. It's a place where you would go and face storms and uncertainty or where warring peoples would come and attack. So this is the place of chaos and storm. The earth-bound kings arise from the sea, and they are likened unto four great beasts. The first is a lion with eagle's wings. Isn't it interesting? Nations tend to pick predatory animals, you know, a a bear, an eagle, be less intimidating to have on your flag, a, a hamster or something. But So these are great, intimidating beasts. And here's one, a royal lion, king of the jungle, and it's given wings like an eagle to soar in all of its majesty and ferocity, but the wings are plucked off. So this king and this kingdom has been humbled and then you notice it says in verse 4, it was lifted up from the ground, made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. So surely I think we are meant to see that this first beast is Babylon, and is Nebuchadnezzar in particular, because what was not Nebuchadnezzar humbled, and he was made to roam for a season as a beast, and then he was given back his right mind to think sanely as a human. Again, we are seeing a picture of Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. And in fact, Jeremiah 4.7 compares Babylon to a lion. Ezekiel 17.3 compares Babylon to an eagle. Come back to identifying these kingdoms at the end. So that's the first. The second is a bear. We read that the bear in verse 5 is raised up on one side. You can read all the commentators. They disagree on what this means. Is it a way of saying it's raised up on its hind legs, it's ready to, to pounce and attack, or they say it has something disfigured that one side is lopsided from another? It has three ribs in its mouth, which surely speaks to its ravenous appetite for destruction. It's already destroyed various beasts and other kingdoms. And then a voice calls it again, arise, devour much flesh. The third is a leopard four wings, four heads. Then the fourth beast, this one is different, even more terrifying. It has iron teeth. It destroys the other animals under its feet. It has ten horns. We read later that they are like ten kings. And then another king, another horn arises. So this horn or this king causes division so that three of the other horns are plucked out. And this horn has the appearance of something of a man, and it has a mouth, and it speaks. This is particularly perplexing and terrifying to Daniel, for this fourth beast is more destructive, more ambitious, more powerful, more arrogant. And we'll say more about the interpretation at the end of the chapter, but step back from the trees for a moment, and what's the general impression of this forest of beasts? Well, we know that we have some kinds of kings and kingdoms. We see that later, and we've already seen that from Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 4. These beasts are strong. These kingdoms are fierce and terrifying. But notice also, again, the general symbolism. What would be the overall impression? If you get lost trying to say, okay, now what do, what do the wings mean and the horns and the leopard and what kind of nation today is more like a leopard or like a bear? you're going to miss the point. The point is they are ugly. They're hideous. 
There's not one that's natural. One thing to have a terrifying lion that's, you know, but sort of a royal figure. This, this ain't Mufasa. It's a scary animal. These are circus animals gone wrong. They have become twisted. Now, notice some of them have uh, some appearance of humanity or are given a mind of a human. This is humanity in its twisted sin and violence. We sometimes say to err is human. I'm going to suggest in just a moment that that's not exactly correct, but if we're speaking of fallen humanity, then certainly to err is human. Sin is ugly. Sometimes people will wax eloquent about truth and goodness and beauty, and we should be pursuing truth and goodness and beauty. Absolutely we should. Here, however, we have an idea of what is beauty and what is ugliness. You can have architectural proportion and wonderfully artful designs and take pleasure in it at a certain aesthetic level, but from the throne room of heaven, what's beautiful and what's ugly is a matter of what's sin and what's righteousness. So these are violent, destructive, rapacious, arrogant kingdoms. They're ugly, they're twisted, they're unnatural. But there's a second vision, verses 9 through 12. And notice, there is a wonderful abruptness in the transition from the first vision to the second vision. Because notice how the first vision leaves off. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. It does not say the mouth was speaking about great things. It's telling wonderful tales and regaling you with fine philosophy. No, when it says he's speaking great things, it means he's speaking about his own greatness. He's, he's boasting. He's speaking of his power, of his might. So you have this first vision, the horn that has uprooted the three other horns and put in jeopardy the ten horns with eyes like a man, and he's a mouth. And so you have the first scene, and there is a disfigured horn on this beast with a mouth, and it's speaking, speaking, speaking great things. And then in an abrupt change, the camera pulls away from this beast while he's still speaking, full of himself and his ambition and his greatness. And we have a different picture. As the mouth on the horn prattles on with its boasts, the camera quickly cuts away to show where the real power in the universe resides. Enough about that. Yes, he's still talking. He's not the real deal. Here's the one who has the real throne. God's people may have been in exile. They may have been facing violent regimes, but the real throne is in heaven, and seated on it is not some disfigured, grotesque, talking horn, but the Ancient of Days. Isn't it striking how God, this is obviously a divine figure, is given this title, the Ancient of Days. In our youth-obsessed culture, you would think that, well, God should be likened to some beefy, strapping young athlete. Maybe I can just say that because I don't resemble any of those things. But I do like the part about the hair, pure wool, white as snow. See, they understood that to speak of a divine figure is to speak of one who is beyond time, beyond our human levels of purity and wisdom and understanding. He is the ancient of days. I would dare to say that if someone calls you, you're ancient, it's not a compliment. Here it is. Purity, the clothing is white, the hair is white, speaking to the being's longevity, of course, it's a theophany, it's a God picture. It's not saying that God is an old man with white hair on a throne, but it's a visual impression of God and His purity, His longevity, His power. He sits on a throne of fire with wheels of fire speaking to the extent of His realm, streams of fire, holy flames of divine power. And notice in verse 10, 
a thousand thousands served him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. That is the ancient way of saying, and there was about a gazillion angels and beings serving and worshiping him. Now remember, Daniel has this vision. Daniel, who so often in this book seems to be the only one standing for what is right. He had his three friends at the beginning, and they stood for what was right, and they've faded from the scene. Perhaps they're dead. But Daniel, he's the only one to interpret the dreams. He seems to be the only one who can stand against the king in this royal kingdom. Daniel, how many times did he wonder, am I the only one? And now in the vision we see, oh, Daniel, you are not alone. Sinclair Ferguson puts it this way, Daniel was an earthly outpost of the heavenly garrison. When you're at that moment and you think no one thinks like this anymore, and you feel like you're the only one in your circle and in your group and your network to believe what is true, to stand for what is true, to know this God and his truth and the word, no one thinks like this anymore. There are a thousand, thousand, and ten thousand times ten thousand times a million serving the ancient of days. You're not alone. We just don't see things as they really are. We may have just forgotten where our true home lies. One of the commentaries I was reading this week, a commentator told the story of a missionary returning from the field many generations ago. He was traveling by boat, and as he returned to the United States, eager for a welcome as he had been serving faithfully as a missionary in fields abroad. There was also on the vessel a famous celebrity, and as this famous celebrity stepped out, he was met to reporters and cameras and a great fanfare of activity welcoming him to his country. The missionary stood alone, no one there to greet him, let alone to cheer him. And then later it occurred to him, what did you expect? you're not home yet. You're not home yet. There will be the ticker tape parade when you get home. We just have often thought that this was our home. No, Daniel, you're not alone. You're not the only one. There are thousand, thousand, ten thousand times ten thousand, and the court is in session From the chaos of the sea to the order of the courtroom, the beast is killed. Yes, the others remain, but their time is limited. They too will be conquered by the ancient of days. Then there's a third vision, verse 13 and 14. The ancient of days is clearly a divine figure, that's obvious. But what about this one? Well, this one too is a divine figure, for we read, he comes with the clouds of heaven. A common Old Testament phrase to refer to a divine visitation. One commentator says about this language of coming with the clouds, quote, if Daniel 7.13 does not refer to a divine being, then it is the only exception out of about 70 passages in the Old Testament, this language, coming of the clouds. Remember, the kings were stirred up from the four winds of the earth, from the sea. Now, this one is a heavenly being, a divine figure coming from the clouds, and he is given an everlasting kingdom. Surely, Daniel must have thought of that messianic psalm, chapter 2, verse 8, ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The Son of Man is given the everlasting kingdom. The same language is used here as was used earlier. If you turn back to Nebuchadnezzar's vision in chapter 2, we read in verse 44, and in those And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left up to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. So this kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar saw, now Daniel sees again. And amazingly, this kingdom, this everlasting dominion, this heavenly realm that cannot be conquered, 
is given to one like a son of man. It's true, the language son of man can sometimes refer to general humanity. Uh, think of Chronicles of Narnia, a son of Adam. It can refer to an individual man. It's the language used of Ezekiel. Daniel chapter 8 will use this language to refer to a person, a son of man. But here it is clearly a divine designation as he comes from the clouds and he receives an everlasting kingdom, not the ancient of days to receive it, but one like a son of man. And do you understand the contrast? We have seen disfigured beasts, unnatural, half human, half wild animal and beast arising from the sea. Now we have one who is true man, real humanity. That's why I said the phrase, to err is human, is true if we're talking about fallen humanity. But this one, like a son of man, shows us what man is supposed to be, what he could have been, what in some sense he will become. He is the true man, capital T, capital M, instead of these man, beast, horrible hybrids. And he is at home in the heavenly courtroom. He is both, it seems, fit to live among men because he is one like a son of man, and he is surely fit to live in heavenly places and to be seated next to God Almighty because he receives from him this everlasting kingdom. Is it any wonder that Jesus uses this designation perhaps more than any other, as his self-identification. Mark chapter 14, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. So do not think that when Jesus says son of man, well, he's obviously referring to his humanity. And son of God is obviously a reference to his deity. Now, son of man is one of the most pronounced, obvious designations actually to his deity, which is why when he says, with the language of Daniel 7, you will see the Son of Man coming with the clouds, receiving a kingdom, sitting at his right hand, they instinctively tear their garments. Blasphemy. He thinks he's divine. Blasphemy for anyone else. Truth when spoken by Jesus. So there are three visions, the beasts, the ancient of days, and one like the Son of Man. Then we see that Daniel struggles to understand his own vision. He so often has been the one giving the interpretation, but now he speaks to some of the holy ones, presumably angelic figures there, interpret it for me. And he receives first a short interpretation and then a second longer one. So verses 15 through 18, here's the first explanation, three visions, two explanations. Here's the first. Verse 16, I approached one of those who stood there, asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation. These four great beasts are four kings. So we were right to think they were four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Now, this is a bit of a surprise because we just heard and saw in the vision that the Son of Man receives this everlasting kingdom. But here, the interpretation is, no, the saints. And the saints here are referring to the holy ones, the people who belong to this Son of Man. That's what it's meant by the saints. Did you see that the Pope today inadvertently tweeted out something in favor of the New Orleans saints? He was trying to speak of three or five Catholics who are canonized today as saints, but because in his Twitter feed he put hashtag saints, 
that's linked to the NFL and it automatically puts a Saint logo, the football team. So people were having quite a lot of fun. One of the Saints players said, wow, I didn't know he was a fan. So before you put hashtag Saints, okay? No, th these, this is not Saints in some other category of believers, but all of us, those who belong to the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man, they shall receive the kingdom. And then Daniel presses for a second explanation. Simple enough in verses 15 through 18, but then he desires to know the truth about the fourth beast. The horn is still going. We read, the horn makes war with the saints and will prevail for a time until, verse 22, that's a great word, until, until the ancient of days came. Verse 21, I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until. Brothers and sisters, there was always an until. Always an until. And it's not a fair fight when the Ancient of Days comes. Remember that scene at Helm's Deep? Gandalf says, look to my coming at first light on the third day. Or is it fourth or fifth? But look to my coming at first light, and sure enough, just when it seems that all is lost, light dawns and here comes Gandalf with the Rohorim down to vanquish their enemies. So it will be when the Ancient of Days comes. So who is this fourth beast which is spoken of so much in Daniel chapter 7? How should we interpret these four beasts, a the lion like an eagle and a bear and a leopard and then this fourth grotesque one with the horns. You won't be surprised to know that scholars disagree. Some say it's representative of the four kings that we see here in Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Darius, and Cyrus. But this tends to be the position of those who are skeptical that Daniel could have a predictive element to his prophecies, and so we better make sure that he's just speaking about things he saw and knew firsthand. Many people see that the four kingdoms are a reference to Babylon, the Medes, the Persians, and then the Greeks. And then others say it's reference to the Babylonian Empire, the Medes and Persians together as one empire, the Greeks, and then the fourth refers to the Romans. You can make a case for either of those two, and good commentators do. I lean toward the latter because the Medes and the Persians seem to be linked together in Daniel as one empire, not two, which would mean the fourth beast here is the Roman Empire. But as I said at the beginning, when we're dealing with apocalyptic prophecy, we would be wrong to limit it to Rome. It is perhaps the Roman Empire, but it is even more than that, the kingdom of all human wickedness. The apex and the climax of human beings left to their own devices to do what they want to do. And we don't have to look hard to see examples of murderous governments and political regimes beyond wickedness and human calculation. Idi Amin slaughtered 500,000 in Uganda, sometimes murdering prisoners by a sledgehammer. 600,000 Armenians were killed by the Turkish government in a single day. Pol Pot is responsible for the death of 2 million in Cambodia. Some 11 million non-combatants killed by the Nazis in World War II. 20 million perhaps died by starvation or other pogroms under Stalin's regime. And under Mao, some 20 to 40 million people died to starvation. Who was it who said that one death is a tragedy and a million is a statistic? You can scarcely even begin to imagine millions and millions, unless we think there's no skeletons in the American closet, some 4,700 lynchings in the South between 1882 and 1968, more than 45 million infants dead through abortion since Roe v. Wade. We must factor total depravity into all of our political science. However you view politics and however you vote, 
It's probably safe to say we should lower our expectations. We should resist utopian dreams and schemes. And in fact, those who have had the greatest, grandest utopian schemes have ended up being the regimes that kill the millions and the millions. Whereas those who have some measure of the fallenness and the perversity and the ambition of man realize that any fallen human government must use ambition to check ambition. We have here perhaps Rome, but even more than that, the climax of human wickedness and rebellion, and perhaps even a look to the end of time in some final sort of antichrist. We know from the New Testament there are many antichrists, but there perhaps is going to be some cataclysmic climax to the opposition to God's people. If the fourth kingdom is Greece, as many people think, then the horn is certainly Antiochus Epiphanes, the abomination that causes desolation. But the little horn may simply be representative of some future earthly leader of earth's final kingdom or representative of any earthly leader and kingdom who wickedness is allowed to run amok. Notice in verse 25 what the horn does, this wicked human leader. He's guilty of blasphemy, persecution, and deification. One, he speaks words against the Most High, that's blasphemy. Two, he shall wear out the saints of the Most High, that's persecution. And three, he shall think to change the times and the law, that's deification. He will think himself a god. I can change the times, I can change the seasons, I can change the laws. Verse 25 says, for a time the saints shall be given into his hand. So even here at this moment where it seems as if the church of God is going to be conquered, even this is under the providence of the ancient of days for he is the one who gives the saints into his hand. But we know, of course, that is not the end, for following verse 25 is verse 26. But the court, the heavenly court, the court with the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man and the 10,000 times 10,000 shall sit in judgment and dominion even from this fourth beast and the horn shall be taken away, consumed and destroyed to the end and the everlasting kingdom shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Three visions, two interpretations. Here's the final overarching point. There will certainly be hard days ahead for God's people. Whether we experience it in our lifetime, whether we experience it here, or we have the opportunity to pray for brothers and sisters in other parts of the world, we can be sure there will be hard days for God's people. Perhaps it will be in our lifetimes when the Congress will pass a law and the President will sign it revoking tax-exempt status for churches and Christian schools and charities. You may have heard one presidential candidate was asked this week if he would support removing tax-exempt status for Christian groups that have a traditional view of marriage, and without hesitation, he said yes. If that happens, it will probably happen to schools first and all those who rely on government programs, and then next, those who have government accreditation, probably last of all the churches, but if such a time comes and all of the financial difficulties that come with it, it will not be a surprise for God, and it will not be too much for God. You are, many of you, facing much harder things, much more immediate tests, and here's what Daniel 7 would have you remember and never forget. The God you cannot see is much, much greater than the powers you can see. The God you cannot see is much, much greater than the powers you can see. The beasts rule from the earth, the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man are co-regents ruling from the clouds. The little horn thinks he's a big deal, but Daniel 7 tells us, ultimate power is not found in Washington, D.C. It's not. It does not rest ultimately on elections. It is not found in New York City or London or Beijing or Brussels. 
do not worry about the horn. Keep your eyes fixed on the throne. That is the point for God's people in the reign of Belshazzar, and that is the point for God's people today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we may live in great comfort and prosperity, or perhaps we are facing many trials. We do pray for brothers and sisters around the world, most of whom face much sterner tests than we are facing. Give them strength, give them resolve. Give to all of us whatever trials we will face, whether it's opposition at some point from our own government, from our own families, from the business community, from our friends, that we would know that greater is the one who is in us than the one that is in the world. Keep our eyes fixed forever on the throne where the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man dwell and where He will return. In Jesus we pray, amen.